Well, good evening and welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Farrell. I'm your mayor. Uh, I'm, thank you so much. It's so great to see so many people here. This is exactly what we wanted to have happen tonight is, is uh, a great turnout like this. Uh, we've got a good program here for you today, but the most important thing that we do tonight is to hear from you. And so that's why we've got uh, cameras here set up. One of the things I want to go over real quickly, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance and, and we're going to get started here pretty soon, but this is so important I want to lead with this, which is the microphone, we've got one microphone that we're going to have people come um, up here and talk. We're being recorded uh, for purposes of making sure that this appears on our channel 21. Uh, we're also going to put it on YouTube, and, and uh, so you can go back later, watch the meeting. We're going to get as absolutely much of it as possible. You know, maybe some breaks or whatever won't be in there, but we want to make sure that we get all of this um, uh, on channel 21 where our neighbors can see it. Maybe a lot of our neighbors couldn't be here or didn't get word about it. Um, so that that's a big part of it as well. So uh, please keep in mind that you're coming comments are going to be on TV and they're going to be on YouTube and that's what this is about. More importantly as well or most importantly your other neighbors that are here, your elected representatives are going to hear it as well and that's that's critical. We do these so we can hear from you and we work for you and that's something that, that every day I know the council feels this way, I know I feel this way, everything we do is for you um, and it's also for this great nation. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. All right. Well, once again, we started these neighborhood connection meetings, uh, you know, I may just go without the podium. We started these neighborhood connection meetings about seven and a half years ago when I became mayor. And really the idea is to bring City Hall to you. Now we've been at various locations, but we're all just coming out of the pandemic. We wanted to make sure for tonight we had a central location that we could get everybody uh, to um, and make sure that, that we heard from our neighbors and that we had technological issues. But we're, we're going to continue doing these and we're going to be out in individual neighborhoods at some of the elementary schools. So let's go through it. Um, this, uh, some of the things I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk your ear off to start off with. I'm going to give you a broad overview. The most important thing is to hear from the uh, subject matter experts um, and then uh, some of the speakers. And then again, uh, toward, uh, toward the end of the, uh, the last half of the meeting, we're going to be hearing from you exclusively. Um, so we're going to talk uh, uh, greetings by Council President Honda. We're also going to, Council President Honda and Council Member Coachmar uh, initiated this, uh, this request to have a meeting right now, coming right out of COVID. And so uh, Council Member Coachmar is going to address uh, uh, the group as well. Uh, we're going to have a, a briefing from Chief uh, Wong in regard to you know, some uh, timely issues here, and he'll talk about that. Um, then we're going to talk about what we're doing in regard to uh, encampment cleanup and our services. And uh, you're going to hear from those folks. We're going to have a uh, public works update to let you know what's going on in the community um, and you know, what your taxpayers are paying, taxpayer dollars are paying for. Uh, we will have a representative from King County uh, Health, Public Health, uh, actually uh, from King County um, uh, Government, and that's Leo Floor. Is Leo here yet? Okay, he was on his way. I talked to him earlier today uh, to talk about that health through housing um, initiative that I know many of you are concerned about. Um, okay, and then obviously by 725, we're going to have public comment, so hopefully well over an hour, um, and we're going to try to get through a program as quickly as possible to be able to hear uh, from you, but we also wanted to make sure uh, that you, uh, you got that information. Um, before I go any further, we're very fortunate to have our state representatives with us, and I'd, uh, let's give a warm federal way welcome to Representative Jesse Johnson. Representative, here we go. And Representative Jamila Taylor. Jamila. And I spoke with, with Representative Taylor before the meeting, and I speak with our representatives frequently. When we get into some of the uh, uh, legal issues that came up uh, with the Blake decision and other things, I, I think that uh, Representative Taylor has offered to maybe provide some, some insight as well. And we can also have uh, uh, working groups or talking groups, obviously uh, not centered on uh, the podium. Um, we also have Council President, oh, I'm going to introduce Council President Honda, just uh, Council President Honda is here. Susan, welcome. 
Council Member Lydia Esefa Dawson. Lydia? <laughs> Council Member Greg Baruso. Greg? <laughs> Council Member Leandra Kraft. All right, and uh, if I see other, uh, other, oh, and we also have uh, our school board, uh, one of our school board directors, Lakeisha Phillips. Lakeisha, good to see you. All right, uh, and as I see elected officials, who are you? I did, I, 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 out. Council Member Coachmar. Very good, exactly, okay. All right, well, um, I wanna say once again, thank you very much for being here. You, uh, you see what, uh, what we've got coming on the agenda. Uh, there'll be uh, ample time and opportunity for uh, public comment uh, and uh, uh, direct uh, uh, question and answer. And so we're gonna capture it on video. I'd like to thank David in the back of the room who captures a lot of these videos and, and uh, uh, helps uh, the trains run on time that way. Once again, thank you for being here. Let me turn it over right now to Council President Honda uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to Council Member Coach Mar as well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm glad that so many people are here and that we're here in person. It's so exciting to see faces and see people again. So as the mayor explained, um, Council Member Kochmar and I requested a meeting, a special uh, council meeting, which two council members can request. And we wanted to discuss crime in our community, homelessness, drug use, and, and treatment. And the mayor agreed and suggested that we hold a neighborhood connection meeting, so that's why we're here. Um, I just want to let you all know that during the pandemic, the council's been really busy working. We'll talk more about that next week at our first in-person council meeting next Tuesday. We hope that you can all come to that at 6.30 at City Hall. I would ask tonight, I know that um, people feel very strongly about these issues that we're all respectful to each other and listen to each other. We're a great community and we all have opinions on on stuff and everyone has a right to their opinion. So um, just please uh, listen and, and be respectful. And um, I would also like to excuse Council Member Tran. He has a, uh, a death in his family and he's away at this time or else he would have been here. So thank you for being here. And I'd like to have Council Member Kochmar come up. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I wanna say thank you to all of you who are here this evening. I can't believe that you all showed up on such a beautiful evening. I've been in this community for over 40 years. I was a mayor in 2010. I was a state representative for four years. What I wanna tell you is the only time that things get changed in this community is when people, when volunteers step forward and get involved, and that's what you're doing. It's so important for you to let your elected representatives know what you think and how what they are doing is affecting you. And especially your legislators that are here this evening, they need to hear from you because what they are doing in Olympia directly affects you. So my goal tonight is simply to hear from you, all of you, I don't care what you have to say, make, make yourselves heard and then get involved. The only way we make a change, the only way you ever make a change is to get involved and to volunteer. Thank you, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Linda. Councilmember Coachmeyer. All right, uh, these are our uh, directors uh, that are present here today. Several of them are going to be speaking, but they're all here in case any, uh, any issues come up. Um, and we also have um, folks that are uh, uh, a little bit below deck uh, directors that have subject matter expertise or with regard to uh, public health or um, uh, community services or traffic. So those are the folks uh, that make up the management team. Um, we've got some up upcoming events we just want to highlight. Uh, next Tuesday, July 20th at 6.30 p.m. is our first in-person Federal Way City Council meeting since COVID hit. And uh, that's going to be great to see everybody. We'd love to see everybody at the council chambers. Uh, Wednesday, July 21st, the next day is our next um, African American Black Quarterly meeting. Now, that'll be via Zoom. We haven't uh, fully transitioned. It was planned before we really opened. I uh, hope everybody can uh, come to that. And then um, uh, Tuesday, August 3rd, is National Night Out. 
Um, and I hope you're planning events in your, uh, in your neighborhoods. That's a great chance for all of us to get together. Um, and uh, I, I try to make as many of those as possible, as I know the council members and uh, the, uh, the chief and I uh, try to go out to those. We also have, I wanted to make sure, we've got movie night at Town Square Park on, uh, the, I believe it's the 24th of July at Town Square Park. Uh, come one, come all. It's always a great uh, event to see the community. All right, uh, with that, let's talk, uh, let's have uh, Chief Andy Wong uh, come on up and give a briefing uh, regarding public safety. Let's give the chief a big warm uh, welcome. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as Mayor stated, my name is Andy Wong. I'm your police chief. I've been your police chief uh, for seven and a half, past seven and a half years, and it's an honor to serve all of you. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I've been given uh, no more than 10 minutes to talk about police-related matters, so I'm gonna go over the materials rather quickly, but during the question and answer session, if you have any questions, I would love to come back up and give you more details about the issues that uh, we're facing in the law enforcement uh, community. So what I'm gonna share with you first, just crime trend, uh, nationally, at the state level, and locally. Just to give you a picture of what is occurring in our nation, at our state, and regionally here. And then I'll talk about what do we do in a federal way that's unique, our initiatives to have a positive impact on crime, our strategic plan, per se, as a community that we've been working on for a number of years, I believe that makes us a little unique uh, versus other uh, communities. The new police reform laws that's gonna bring significant change to how we deliver police services moving forward. Not just here in federal way, this is statewide. So I'd like to just give you the highlights of that and what are we doing internally as a police department to prepare for that, because it's next week. And then building trust and partnership with the community. Without your support, without your trust, our police department is not gonna be successful. We're not gonna be successful as a city, but we do a lot of uh, work to build that trust and wanna share just a couple of things with you on that. Last year, our murder rate in our country shot up 25%. We haven't seen an increase like this as a nation for the past 30 years. So this is unprecedented, it's significant, and unless you live under a rock, there's a lot of news coverage about crime in our nation. And it's really being dri um, driven by the drug epidemic that's occurring in our country. The second, so last year we had about 20,000 murders, that's highest since 1995. And then that went up from 16,000. So there were about 4,100 murders last year. Uh, so far this year, as a nation, we're seeing another 25% increase. And at this pace, we might actually catch up to the most violent era in our country, which was back in the 80s and 90s because of the crack cocaine drug ed epidemic. So back then, we had about 25,000 murders. And as a nation, we were saying that's too much crime, too much violence. We took a lot of direction as a nation to reverse that. So past 20 years or so, the murder rate has steadily dropped to its like lowest level. We were down to 14, 15,000 murders. Last year, now we're up to 20,000. And foreseeable future, it will get worse. Last year in Washington, we had 302 murders from 206, we saw a 46% increase of murders in the state of Washington. California had 31% increase. I think we are up there in terms of percentage increase is one of the highest in the nation. King County, we had 121 murders in 2020. Total shots fired incidents, we had over 1,000 incidents, 19% increase from 2019. Uh, 337 shooting victims, up 36%, and the fatal shootings went up 27%. The homicide rate in King County continues to soar. In the first quarter of this year, we saw another 36% increase for homicides. So far this year in Federal Way, we've had three murders and one manslaughter. Not only has homicide rates increased, but the rate of officers being assaulted has steadily increased over the years. Last year we saw a 6% increase, but since, um, uh, I got a little ahead of myself there. 
Okay. So there were 264 officers killed in the line of duty last year. That's federal, state, county, and local law enforcement agencies. That's a 98% increase from uh, 133. Many of these duties, many of these um, officers that, that died or line of duty death due to COVID. And I'll tell you, it was really challenging year for us uh, for the past 18 months because we didn't get a break. And there were times that I had multiple officers, even dozen officers out because of COVID. We had a couple of officers who were hospitalized, but they uh, recovered. So I'll tell you, staffing wise, it's been really challenging. It's been better with the vaccination. We have we don't have anybody with uh, COVID right now, but it's been a really challenging year for us in, in law enforcement. It's also been a very violent year for us in 2020 as well, and it, it's continuing. Um, and this is the last bullet I was getting to. In state of, this is state of Washington. We saw a 6% increase, 67% increase since 2016. Um, I just wanted to share that with you. It's not been easy being a police officer. Um, Okay, so what's unique for us uh, strategically, and we do solve a lot of crime. Uh, we've been investing in safe city uh, camera programs, and any year that we've received grant funding from the state, we've expanded our camera system. We have over 250 cameras throughout our community. At, at various intersections, we actually have license plate reading uh, camera systems. And this is how we catch a lot of crooks, because a lot of crooks don't know that but they'll drive their vehicle through. Uh, sometimes stealing a vehicle is precursor for committing other violent crimes because they, they want the anonymity. So that's, that's an issue, but from time to time, they'll literally be driving you know, their family vehicle or something like that, and uh, we're tracking them down. You know? So that is really unique to us. Most communities don't have the robust camera system that we have here in Federal Way. And they're most often used for traffic actions, frankly. Um, at their most intersections, major intersections, and it's quite often used for collisions because uh, both sides says, hey, I had the green light, and we're able to go back and confirm that. So it's used most often for traffic accidents, but we use it for criminal investigation as well. And then um, we have four vehicles that we have automated license plate reader vehicles. And though that technology in our kind of urban environment does a tremendous job identifying stolen vehicles, or vehicles that have association to a wanted person. So we, we tend to catch a lot of violent offenders through our automatic, uh, automated license plate reader technology. And that's, that's, how the, that's how they look on the vehicles. And they can read thousands and thousands of uh, license plate. If an officer was running license plate on their computer, how many could you possibly run on a, a given shift? But those are just constantly running. And that gives us the advantage. One of the things, um, when you don't see it, you don't see it as a problem, but we've done this for a number of years. We have a, a graffiti abatement program. You would be hard to find uh, any really graffiti within the city limits of Federal Way because when graffiti is identified, and we talk about a management team weekly, and they're removed immediately. But if you go to other communities, you're going to find a lot of graffiti, and they're not removed. So that's one of the things that we do here in Federal Way because we don't want... Uh, graffiti, particularly gang graffiti, and then we have issues. So when, they, when they're put up, when it's identified, we move it immediately. And then illegal uh, encampment initiative. Um, we've been doing this for a number of years. I can tell you from the police department perspective, last September, we kind of reached our peak in terms of crime. We were hearing a lot of, from business community, uh, particularly the business community on uh, Highway 99 and some of the major um, you know, roadways within our community. And we had reached about 100 burglaries a month. And we had gone from around 50 or so, it got to about 100, and we were hearing about it from the business community, whether were elected officials or the police chief. So we had to, we had to get more proactive in addressing it, because when we did catch burglars, or we had surveillance video from the business owner, quite often they were the homeless population. So we started actually uh, addressing illegal homeless encampments. We're at, a, we're at a point now, we've made tremendous progress because a lot of our encampments are not occupied anymore. We're now down to maybe 50 burglaries a month again. Now, obviously, I'd like to see it lower, but 
trust me, from a police perspective, when you go from 50 burglaries a month to 100, and that goes on, um, it's a problem So for the business community. So we're really glad that this particular initiative has made some positive difference. I recognize more work needs to be done, but I just want to share that with you from a crime perspective uh, from the police department. Okay, so they were in place work. We're used to making changes. And that occurs all the time. It may be case law that says you can only do a search at a particular situation, or there may be a new law that comes in place, and we are constantly evolving, training, best practices. I would tell you that all the years that I've been in police work, we hadn't seen this much new laws in terms of police reform. We had 13 bills this year. So there's tremendous work going on in the administrative section. We have training going on right now. We have to train 120, uh, 130, 40 employees on all these new laws. So we have people involved training. We're going to do it every day until we get to the 25th. And we will cover everyone with the training. Tremendous resource and time is going in to make sure our staff are prepared. But we're not used to having this much change in a single year. So th it, it was a lot, but we are used to making change. And being a nationally created law enforcement agency, um, majority of the reforms we're, we're already doing. So it wasn't that everything was new. A lot of the things we we're already doing best practices as a cre accredited law enforcement agency. But I'm just going to share with you just major highlights that it's impacting law enforcement agencies across the state. Oh. So House Bill 1054, uh, this is you know, police tactics. The biggest thing that's changing on this is there will be no very few police pursuits moving forward. Uh, very restrictive police pursuits is that you've got to have probable cause of a particular violent crime, and that person that you're going to chase, you have to show that they're going to be an imminent threat, immediate threat to someone else. Probable cause is a very high standard, and to have that and to sh be able to show that they're an imminent threat to someone else, uh, it's going to be a very high burden. So virtually statewide, um, you know, there are going to be very uh, little pursuits. So that's the biggest change. House Bill 1310, it covers use of force incident, and this is where this is the bill that's going to have the biggest change uh, moving forward for us because in order for a police officer to use physical force on another person, you have to have probable cause to arrest, generally. So what that means is that there are a lot of times we're responding to a call in which we don't have probable cause to arrest. Because as the officer's racing to a call, you're getting radio dispatch information. So you're getting information about a vehicle, person description, and if things are dynamic, things are evolving very quickly. So what happens quite often, middle of the night, one or two in the morning, while you're racing to a call, you'll see a vehicle that matches the general description. So a savvy police officer doing good police work goes, ah, that's the suspect's vehicle, makes a U-turn. And quite often I get notification about a pursuit, arrest, that type of thing. Well, what's different now is while you're responding, that information I shared with you, you have reasonable suspicion. So federal law, federal standard, if you have reasonable suspicion, the police officers are authorized to use reasonable amount of force to detain while we further investigate. So in this state, moving forward, you cannot detain people for reasonable suspicion anymore. So what that means is we're not, one, you can't pursue, and two, if you have a shoplifter or a burglar leaving the scene and they continue to run, we can't chase because when we run after them, we have to tackle them, right? So moving forward, I'm going to tell you, with shoplifting calls, low-level crimes like that, we will no longer be using physical force. We will ask for voluntary compliance, but if they run, they get into a vehicle, we're gonna to have to just let them go because we will not have probable cause because we haven't had made contact, okay? So how's that? That's the biggest change for us moving forward. 
Federal Way Police Department, we're all going to body-worn cameras. House Bill 1223, moving forward, January of... <laughs> January of 2022, in order for us to interrogate anyone for a crime, we have to either audio or video record moving forward. So this, we were working towards body-worn cameras anyways, but this clearly expedited it, and we have to have have to have funding to do it because without it, we won't be able to conduct any interviews. If you're investing in a hit and run crime at an intersection and here's a suspect, how are you going to audio record? So we're not gonna be able to use a cell phone. That's not gonna meet our needs technology wise. So we are moving forward, council approved for us to uh, get the body worn camera. So first year will cost us about a million dollars, but about a million dollars a year moving forward. But we're gonna go with body worn cameras here. I'm gonna skip that. Uh, new drug laws. Um, in February of this year, Washington Supreme Court uh, made a determination that our felony drug possession was unconstitutional. So having that, our council decided that we were gonna create our own ordinance for officers to enforce and make arrest. State preempted that so that local jurisdictions could not have their own ordinances on drug enforcement. So now moving forward, the legislative intent is very clear. They do not want us taking enforcement action on drug, felony drug violations. So what, what we need to do now is we have the system in place. If we catch somebody with drugs, doing drugs, we need to give them two warnings. So individual gets two warnings. They get resource material for treatment. Officer has to write the report, put the evidence in, all that, but we give them two referrals. Then on the third one, we can actually give them a citation for possession of drugs. Simple misdemeanor. Um, so if somebody gets two these warnings in Auburn, two in Seattle, two in Kent, two in Fed. There's no statewide data system for us to know. So that that's so so here's what I'm gonna tell you. Drug um, really drives in terms of crime, drive 80, 90 percent of the time. I can tell you right now that when we go to a shooting, we're investigating it. When we get done investigating, 80, 90% of the time, it's either domestic violence or it's drug related. It's quite often. So until we can turn off the faucet for drug demand in this country, I'm telling you that we're gonna we are in another drug epidemic because the pain pill medication, opioid, we have a drug epidemic, so it's now shootings, murders are going up. So I would ask you, um, until we can address that as a community, and there's tremendous amount of drug flowing into our communities right now. Our, we have a detective, part of the DEA task force here in South King County, and I get briefings on that. It's amazing what the organized crime, drug cartels are bringing drugs into our community just because there is a demand. So how do we get people off drugs? But the legislators have decided it will no longer be the police issue, okay? So it'll be treatment-based. Okay, so that's, that's the drug law. Um, I wanted to just, I talked about us being a, a nationally accredited agency. We're one of eight agencies in the state of Washington that is nationally accredited. It is good that we are nationally accredited because we are, our policies are best practices. Um, it's difficult to be accredited. That's why most agencies don't do it, and we have about 52 agencies that are state accredited. They have, so you, accreditation, whether state or nation, is a good thing is what I'm telling you. Um, and then we're up for reaccreditation this year. We should be reaccredited in November in Jacksonville, Florida. So we're looking forward to that, and we're prepping and preparing for our accreditation because we have assessors that will be doing the assessment for us. So we're busy bodies in the police department right now. Typically, we shouldn't be working on so many policy issues in the summer, but uh, we are working hard. And then, uh, I just want to provide the contact information for uh, 
our national night event, August 3rd. I would really encourage you as communities, neighborhoods, call Lindsay. She'll set you up. It's a great night to just do a little barbecue with your neighborhood coming out of COVID. I, I think, it, and we will come visit you. The elected officials will come visit you and you can continue on um, with these discussions. And then uh, we're partnering again uh, with other businesses in our community and Wild Waves. Wild Wave has given us tickets. So our officers are getting uh, Wild Wave tickets. When they catch kids doing positive things, we are now in the process of distributing uh, positive tickets in our community. So we're really excited about that. And I'm not going to talk about crime numbers, but I brought it because somebody told me people might be interested in talking about crime. But if that issue comes up, I have a couple of slides on that. And again, thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you, Chief. Uh, the non-emergency number is right here, 835-2121. Uh, um, and for the crime statistics, you can email anybody here, uh, either staff or myself or a, a council member. We'll get you the, a copy of the PowerPoint and the crime statistics. All right, now we've got the nuisance, nuisance, nuisance abatement process. Uh, Brian, we're running a little bit late. Maybe we can just kind of uh, hit the highlights and, and just talk generally about what we're doing. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Um, so the scope of this brief presentation is to talk about properties that uh, have what we call nuisances or litter, trash, things that need to be cleaned up. So we'll kind of go through this as fast as I can. Okay, um, that's pretty obvious. If your property's dirty, you need to clean it up. <laughs> okay, so this one is, uh, I'm not gonna go through that, but this shows you that um, there's a process when we're dealing with private property, there are rights built into our code. It allows a property owner uh, time to take or respond to the city's actions and they can through various means they could uh, drag it out uh, to where it's a little bit lengthier than, than some people would like. Um, most of the cases that we deal with they're, they're resolved pretty quickly. We'll get a call from a, from a concerned citizen or a complaint on uh, our new um, C-Click Fix uh, interface um, and they're, pretty, they're resolved pretty quickly. The, every now and then we do get non-compliant owners uh, where it's just taking a little bit longer and those range about three to six months so it's a little bit longer. Now there's some really non-compliant owners that will drag it on even longer and I want to talk about that real quickly. So as I mentioned due process is what I mentioned before with the timeline. It, it built, builds into property rights and so it takes a little bit longer. So this is an example that we dealt with uh, just this year. Actually we've been dealing with it for a couple of years now but it ended in the process of ending this year. So, uh, residential property, very littered with junk. In fact, let me just skip to the next picture. Here's the property. So it's a house, and this actually is kind of a, it's kind of a peekaboo shot into the, into the problem because the street is lined with vehicles that's, that's attempting to shield what's really going on. So that's our best picture that we could find, uh, capture what's going on here. So we went through the process. The owner hired an attorney. We went to court. They racked up $300,000 in fines uh, that we had um, issued to them. Went to mediate. The court required mediation, so we went to mediation that we had to pay for. And in the end, the court said, um, "Hey, you know what? Why don't you clean up your property?" Um, <laughs> which is what we originally said. So it took all that process to get the same decision that we originally asked them to do. So my, my point is if people want to drag it out, unfortunately, they can. Uh, another dynamic that we see is a lot of repeat property. So we'll, we'll go out and we'll clean up a property, and then a month later, it'll get, it'll get dirty again. And so it sometimes has the appearance that nothing is being done on the property or that's constantly dirty, um, when in fact there is, some, there is some cleanup that has happened, and so it's just a matter of staying on top of it. These are a couple of, of uh, examples. The, the property at the corner of 320th and 1st, has been, is, it's, a, it's got an illegal camp in there. It's been, uh, this has been for many years. Uh, it's been cleaned up a couple times. It gets dirty, right now it's dirty again. Uh, the property behind the 1st Avenue Library, uh, which is the um, hospital property, same thing. It's been dirty a number of times. Hospital actually is, is one of those owners that responds really well and they do a good job of cleaning it up. And, but that's another one where if you, might, if you drive by, you might see some um, 
items at the entrance of the library that goes back into the property. And if you were to go back in there, uh, you'd see a lot more. I'm not telling you to do that because that's trespassing, but um, we, have, um, we have seen that. So one of the most effective things that we've seen with properties that, are, um, that get occupied is to um, allow the owner to do an underbrush clearing without any kind of permitting that uh, would normally have to take place. Usually, our code usually says, if you, if you want to do any type of clearing or, or land movement, you got to have some kind of development proposal associated with that. And what we recently did about four years ago is we provided a, a means by which property owners could go in with, with just a letter that we issue. It's not a permit, it's at the front of the line, it's free, and we issue that to property owners so that they can get moving on basically opening up their, the visibility of their property so that it's not as inviting for an illegal camp to establish itself. Um, and this has been very effective. One of the um, most recent examples, or one of the best examples I could cite is um, right on the corner of 336 and Pack Highway, uh, about three or four years ago, it, it may have noticed dri driving by that, that some of the, the underbrush was cleared so that you could see in a little better, just been driving up and down the highway. Um, it's, that was some time ago, so it's starting to grow back, so we, we'll have to talk to them again about clearing that up. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, most of these that we get, they're, they're cleaned up pretty quickly. We'll get a complaint, we'll go out, we'll contact the owners. They're usually very good to work with. They're very, usually very quick to clean up. Um, we've had, um, just last year, we had 3,600 complaints, or excuse me, annually. This is the average, excuse me, this is the average. 3,600 complaints annually, and only about 1% of them are the ones that, that we have difficulty dealing with that. And they're probably the ones that you're most concerned about because then they don't get cleaned. But I want to assure you that we are working on, and sometimes it takes a little bit longer to deal with uh, because we do have owners that sometimes um, are, are just difficult to work with. But I can tell you that each of the ones that we have dealt with eventually do get cleaned. Um, so that is it. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, John Hutton. John, come on up. Um, I know that uh, I saw the comments and we've heard the comments and we were very much aware of what's happening at 348th and 9th at the behind the park and ride. We were waiting on King County to clean that up, but we also had an issue. Uh, well, actually, I don't want to take all of John's presentation. So why don't we just uh, give uh, John Hutton, our parks director, a warm welcome. Thank you very much. I don't have any. Thank you very much and welcome to your Federal Way Community Center. We're very proud of this building and glad we could uh, host you tonight. So I uh, do want to let you know that we had a 12-person crew today over at uh, the 348th and 9th Avenue site off the park and ride that the mayor just referenced. Uh, and so we got a lot out of there today. The job is not done. Thank you. Uh, oh, as you can see, uh, they don't tell me anything. So. Uh, so as you can see, we got a little bit before and a little after. The picture on the top left is how we left the site today. We actually leave a toter there in the hopes that someone may actually throw something in it. That would be really helpful. And we're still optimists in the Parks Department. So um, we want to uh, let you know that we were there today. We will continue and we're making continued efforts. I'm actually going to the City Council on Tuesday night to present a question if we can uh, get permission to go out to bid to get a contractor on, uh, on retainer, if you will, to help us clean these up because these are large sites. In many cases, that is a particularly large site. And when I say large, I'm talking about acres and acres of, of land, not that it's all fouled like this, but um, a lot of it is. And so we at the Parks Department don't get a lot in the parks of, of uh, illegal encampments. When we do, we try to take care of it immediately. Um, but it doesn't happen often in the parks. It's more land like this, public land that is under parks jurisdiction, but it's not a park per se. Um, we do try to take care of that as quickly as possible, and we have a commitment as a department. We're very thinly staffed. We only have 13 park workers, park maintenance workers. So we do have a commitment, though, that we go out and clean one a month at least. Uh, and that's the only way we can keep going and keep the other services that you all appreciate um, going and the parks looking beautiful for you. So with that, um, 
uh, sometimes people ask, why don't you just take a bulldozer in there and get it? Well, this is a very sensitive habitat, as you're probably aware. This is salmon rearing uh, stream. We have worked closely with lots of gr different groups, including the Federal Way School District, and we've planted over 10,000 coho salmon fry in that stream. So we need to be careful with the ecosystem and take care of the land, and which also takes care of the streams. We don't want a bunch of runoff from heavy equipment running into the stream and fouling the, the spawning grounds uh, for our salmon. So um, with that, that's our commitment, and we are there. We were there today. We wanted you to see the pictures. Those are actually taken today, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're proud of the work that we do. Uh, we would love to do less of this, obviously, and more of the stuff that you all appreciate. But um, with that, that's what I have from a parks perspective, sir. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, do we have a, a presentation from, all right. Uh, we also have, um, we did a big presentation at the last city council meeting with uh, Deputy Chief Neal, who lead, actually, uh, Chief Neal, could you uh, please stand up? He actually heads our uh, homeless encampment initiative uh, that go that has been working on cleaning up um, encampments throughout the city for the past five years. In fact, it was uh, I think it was February or March, in March of 2016, where we started. I, I put uh, Deputy Chief Neal in conjunction with the chief uh, in charge of encampment cleanup, and there have been um, documented on a spreadsheet about 225. Many of those are multiple locations uh, in which there are reoccupation, but. Where are would uh, well, well? Let me turn it over to Chief Neal just real quickly to get some sort of estimate in regard to uh, the the scope of what we, what you've been up to. Thank you. I just want to touch on a few things with the the homeless initiative. As the mayor said, we've been actually involved with that program since 2016, when we noticed a rise in the homeless population here in Federal Way. So. Uh, with, with the mayor's blessing, we decided to begin this initiative so that we could combat the illegal camps and also provide services to the homeless in our community. So uh, in 2016, we, we began uh, just really addressing the camps himself, coming up with things such as brochures in order to hand out to the, to the people experiencing homelessness in our, in our city our community places, things that they could do, places they could go, phone numbers and that sort of thing. So we've been doing that for some time now and through the evolution of this, one thing that, that we did really ramp up is our Special Operations Unit, SOU. You, you might have heard that acronym, but uh, that is, at, the, at present time, it is four officers that really seven days a week that's all they do, and they primarily work daytime hours, but all of they do from morning till night is address these types of issues uh, within the city. So there's, there's uh, uh, lots of complexity to, to this particular program. Of course, we're dealing with the humanistic part of it. We're dealing also with the fact that uh, 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 Brian and John talked about our, our wetlands and our, our th those sorts of places where uh, these illegal camps uh, wreak havoc with those sorts of environments. So we try to keep that down. But there's also the issue that we deal with every day, which is the difference between public property and private property. It's much easier for us to address the, the public uh, property encampments, illegal encampments there. But we also try to work closely with the, with the uh, private community, the landowners, so that we can also provide them with at least resources, services, information, and that sort of thing so that they can handle it as well. And then also give them tips on the actual cleanup because that is really the hardest part other than the humanistic part of it. The hardest part is actually cleaning up the debris as, as you saw uh, in, in these camps. So, where we hit it, we hit it every day. Where and I don't see it going away anytime soon. But we have had a dramatic impact, I think, especially over about the last year, on the actual camps in the community. And it is true. Sometimes the the people that we deal with, they simply move to another place. The the mayor talked about. One of the biggest problems that we have is reoccupation, whether it's uh, a camp is cleaned and then a week later there's somebody back in the camp. So that is something that's very difficult for us to, to deal with and we do that as best we can. Uh, we try to provide, as I say, uh, recommendations to the landowners. 
Uh, Brian talked about land clearing, things like that. It, they, they work, but they're expensive. But uh, we do, we have been able to find things all along the way that do make it easier for us to, to deal with this particular problem. All right. Thanks, Chief Neal. EJ. All right, now uh, EJ Walsh, our Public Works Director regarding uh, Public Works Update. So good evening, my name's E.J. Walsh, I'm the Public Works Director. So real quick, we want to take a moment and talk about a couple of the capital projects that we're working on. So in the back there are books with the Capital Improvements Project, those are also on our website um, that you can see. So a couple of the projects I want to touch and just give a short update on is the City Center Access Project, which is around downtown. There was a public open house that starts August 23rd where we're seeking input on the various designs from the community. And then on a related but not city project, Sound Transit. So in August, you should start seeing the girders going up in the downtown area for this new station. Those are set to start being put in the air mid-August. And then the other project we wanted to talk about is 373rd. So as I'm sure many of you are familiar, there's been a, a couple of pretty serious accidents down there recently. So we did, the city did take the first steps of restricting left turn movements down there as a temporary measure. We're working with WashDOT to allow us to put in a center barrier to prevent um, those turning movements completely. And then ultimately we are also working on a new grant application to put in a roundabout at 373rd and Pack Highway to make it safer. So the other, uh, tool that we've developed over the last year is a web application where you can see all the city current projects and get more information. This is on the city website. Um, so instead of going through every project, I want to point this out to you tonight and encourage you to use it. If you have any questions, please reach out to the public work staff. And then lastly, the 2021 pavement project. So this has been a long journey to get to the point where we're back into the residential neighborhoods. Um, this is the first year that we restarted the residential overlay program and that was done through uh, council's approval of an additional solid waste excise tax, um, which has allowed us to overlay many streets that frankly the city hasn't overlaid in our history. Um, so many of the streets that were overlaid this year, it's the first time since the city incorporated that that work was done. Um, so it's been that long since we did that work. We've also focused on having city crews start low volume residential overlays as well as gravel road patching. Um, and as I'm sure you can imagine, all of this has been pretty well received by the community that we're out there fixing the potholes and getting the roads back into in good condition. Because um, that has been our history is to have that, that, those good roads in the community. Um, the one other thing, and I think Brian mentioned it as well that I want to um, touch on real fast, is the city's incorporated Eyes on Federal Way, which is an app that you can use on your phone or on a computer through the web. That's the fastest way to get anything you see in the community directly to, whether it's my staff, Brian's staff, the police department. When you enter something on that for public work, so like if you put there's something blocking the road, it's dispatched directly to public work staff. It doesn't go through our admins and then through, you know, someone picking up the phone and calling someone else. It's sent right to that crew. That being said, it's a great tool and a lot of people have um, started reporting stuff, so, which is good. It lets us, you know, there's a lot more eyes in this room alone than on our staff. So it lets the public input it, um, but it does, it's not instantaneous that we have staff out there. So please know that we've gotten your, your, your comment. Um, we do respond to it as quickly as we can, but please know it's not instantaneous, but know that we've gotten it and we're working on it. And with that, I will turn it back over to the mayor. Um, we do have, originally we would put this together, we wanted to make sure that you heard from the directors and about city programs. I was hearing a lot of feedback <clears throat> and questions in the community about the uh, health housing initiative and what's being proposed at two hotels. So I reached out to Executive Constantine's office uh, earlier. They, they knew generally about the meeting that was coming up and they knew about public interest. 
But I reached out to Shannon Braddock, who's the chief of staff to Dow Constantine today. And, uh, and actually, we had been talking with uh, Leo Floor, uh, the uh, director here who's with us. And so he's actually uh, come here tonight to be able to uh, speak to you, give you some information about uh, what's being proposed. Uh, we've, there's two hotels. Let me just give you just a brief thumbnail before. Oh, Leo, come on up, um, please. Let's give him a, a big federal way welcome. What I really appreciate is Leo started his day and he did not know he was going to be in federal way tonight. And I really appreciate him coming down here and be able to answer questions. Um, so there's two properties in question, uh, one at Red Lion, one extended stay. They're different uses, different types, but I'm not going to steal your, uh, your, your thunder, Leo. So thank you very much. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so welcome, or I should say welcome to myself to joining you in federal way. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you can see what I do for uh, most of the day. So my name is Leo Floor, and I work at King County's Department of Community and Human Services, and I have the privilege of being the director there. Uh, and so uh, what uh, the mayor said would be helpful is to give an introduction to our program called the Health Through Housing Program. Uh, so I'll give some information about what that is and what it isn't. Uh, and then uh, I did notice on the way in, it was on the tables, and I think this is really uh, you know, the, the important context. Uh, a lot of the presentations were just about this. Uh, we have a lot of homelessness in our community. Uh, before the pandemic, we had 12,000 people in King County who lived uh, without a home of their own, 6,000 of them outside. We have every reason to believe that that number has increased dramatically over the last year. Uh, so uh, I know that you see that in your community. Uh, we see that in every community in King County. Uh, we certainly see it in Seattle, uh, but you see it in North Bend. Uh, I imagine that you see it in uh, Federal Way. We've been working together on trying to get a metro uh, park and ride cleared. And so uh, one of the things that we really know with homelessness is that uh, it will continue to get worse unless we do something to change that. Uh, another thing that we know with homelessness uh, is that uh, it's not coming from someplace else. Uh, you may have seen in the Seattle Times, there was just an article about everybody in Port Angeles or Squim thought it was coming from somebody else and it, it turned out that it was there. And what we are finding is that the things that drive homelessness, uh, that housing is too expensive, that people don't make enough money. In some cases, people um, have drugs. Um, and uh, when folks do have addictions, uh, the thing that we know helps them to leave those addictions is treatment. And we know that treatment works best when somebody has the ability to be housed. Um, so the... And, and um, you know, I, I, I certainly don't come here to, to your city to, to tell you what's going on. I, I, just say, I say that as the, the context. Um, homelessness is getting worse, it will continue to get worse, and so the question is, what can we do? One thing that we know works is for people to be housed. Um, and so the Health Through Housing program in King County is a sales tax uh, that the County Council enacted last year, and what we do with the sales tax is we go out and we purchase hotels. Uh, and the reason to purchase a hotel right now is that there is no sector of the economy that was worse hit than the hospitality sector over the last year. Uh, and what we're able to do is buy hotels for less money than they would normally cost. And we're also able to buy hotels and, and convert them into housing for about half the price that it costs to build new housing uh, in our community right now. Uh, and if you want to be shocked, the cost to build a new unit of housing in a sort of William Wood House style uh, of building, which is a really successful uh, permanent supportive housing building in federal way that is very much like what we are talking about, is about $425,000 a unit. Which sounds like a lot and is about the amount that it costs to buy a house um, or a, a recently built home anywhere in King County right now. Uh, we are averaging $200,000 a unit when we buy a house or buy a, a, a hotel. So every time we buy hotels, uh, an extended stay type hotel is ideal because it has a kitchen, it's essentially an apartment. Uh, and we're averaging about $200,000 per unit when we do that. So it's a good chance to take something that is already expensive, uh, but to do it for less expense, to be a little bit more efficient, and then to be able to, and I think this, this is one of the most important par parts when we talk about the urgency of homelessness. It doesn't take four years to buy a hotel. It takes four years to build new housing, to site it, to permit it, to construct it. Uh, we have these hotels and as we purchase them, we will be able to put them into action to bring people inside in our county uh, and do that this year to make a difference. We've already purchased and announced four hotels. 
Uh, so two in Seattle, one in the Uptown neighborhood, which is like the new name that they gave to Lower Queen Anne for some reason. Uh, one in North Seattle. Uh, we've purchased a hotel in Renton. Uh, we've purchased a hotel that we announced yesterday in Redmond. Uh, in each of these cases, uh, what we've done, uh, we are a learning organization our, ourselves. We've gone in, we've spoken uh, to the local elected officials, to the mayors, and said where would be the right type of location, um, what parts of the city wouldn't be the right type of location, here's what we're looking for, had those conversations, and then been able to identify potential buildings. So, uh, another key point is, what is the difference between shelter and housing? What we're talking about with health through housing is housing. Shelters are places that play important roles in our communities. Uh, folks come to a shelter, uh, they tend to stay less uh, for, for a, sh a shorter duration. There tends to be higher turnover. There's less sort of community that forms amongst the people who live in a shelter. Uh, and then the, it's really a place to get initially stabilized but then hopefully move on to housing more quickly. Housing is a place where you can move in and you can stay there. Uh, you form communities. And again, uh, I do think that a really powerful example of this that King County was privileged to work on in the city of Federal Way uh, is the William Woodhouse, uh, where we've got 44 units of permanent supportive housing for veterans and their families who moved, moved into it as they were experiencing homelessness or as they were at risk of homelessness. And that's the same type of, of person that we're really looking to serve with the Health Through Housing program. Another thing, and, and, and I heard it, uh, you know, drugs, uh, substance use, uh, with the Health Through Housing program, the health part is really important. It doesn't just happen automatically when you put somebody in housing. You have to provide treatment. You have to provide services. So the Health Through Housing program is King County's richest service level where we will have 24-7 on-site behavioral health services for the people who reside in those units. Uh, we have that built into the budget it's funded with the same fund source that provides the funding for the actual capital acquisition. And then the county council actually recently also just approved an additional $2 million so that we can provide opioid specific treatment in health through housing buildings so that folks who are living there get the treatment uh, while they're there. And again, we just know that that is most effective. Um, what if someone doesn't want Yeah, um, what we know is, is the vast majority of people do eventually will accept treatment. Most people want to get better, and the highest success rate is for people who are housed. I've been in multiple camps uh, across King County. I'll also share with you, and I don't do this to, to be dramatic, but this is really important to me. This is why I do this work. Uh, I've been in Iraq, I've been in Afghanistan, and I, I get a little choked up about this. I have never seen people living like they live in King County in encampments right now. I have been to some of the worst places in the world, and it, it's unacceptable to me. Um, we can bring people inside, and people do better when they are housed, and for every person that we might say, you know, doesn't succeed in housing, Many more do. And for us to be able to make a change for the thousands of people who live outside in our community right now, we have to be able to bring them in. We have to be able to do what the evidence shows is the most effective. Uh, the University of Washington, the University of Washington conducted a study on our use uh, of hotels as shelter. Uh, this study was conducted over the course of 2020. Anybody can access it. And uh, you know, the researchers at the University of Washington provided for an initial look and said that this was a stabilizing force. It is a place where we know that people get more treatment. Um, it is a place where people are going to be more successful. And so it's, uh, you know, I'm not a person who's gonna say that this is a cure-all. It's not gonna solve it for everybody, but for. So the University of Washington, there's a person named Greg Colburn uh, who did a study that actually showed in, in King County that people who are housed in a hotel were able to be more successful than when they were in the congregate shelter or outside. Yeah. Hey, Leo's going to be here to answer questions. So let's make sure that we get this, that you, that the folks that are going to watch this on TV can hear your question and hear the answer and that you get your full, your full question out. So uh, Leo, do you have anything else before we turn it over? Because I'm going to leave you up here with me at first. <laughs> 
No, so um, I, I am happy to stay as long as I need to to at, answer questions. Um, it is a program where we purchase hotels, create the housing, get the treatment on site, again, at a higher level of treatment. Uh, and I do find that often hypothetical, um, what could happen, uh, the best antidote to that is to see where we're talking about this actually happening and just be able to look at it. Um, and you do have permanent supportive housing, just like what we were talking about creating in the city of Federal Way. It is the William J. Woodhouse, I think, is a really good example of that. Um, and, uh, you know, they took folks who were living outside, many of whom had addictions. Uh, they live in that place right now. They receive treatment. It's operated by the outstanding organization, the multi-service center, and, and, and they provide the housing. They connect folks to treatment. And I think seeing it in real life is a really good way to see what's possible and to, to be able to draw your own conclusions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Somebody from the back said, thank you for your service to our country. And thank you, Leo, for your service. Um, So I, we're, we're about we're running five minutes, or maybe 10 minutes behind to get to the most important part of the meeting is to hear from the public. So I don't know, uh, does Pam, Pam, do you have a sign-up sheet? Or do we have? Let's just have people line up behind the microphone. Um, and then we're going we're gonna to be here to answer questions. And uh, let's check to see if the microphone's on. Check, check. All right, the microphone's on. All right. And, we're going to have our directors that spoke, or any director that's here, is, and including myself, or council members, the chief, anybody's here to answer questions as well. So let's go ahead and get started. And uh, go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Erica Norton. Um, I just had a couple questions because the William Wood House is a trap house. I've worked there. Everyone is on drugs and drinking there. The, the people who went there to counsel those people are not happy with what's happening there because no one is taking part in services. I own a cleaning company and I actually refused to go back there and clean because of the things that I was encountering and my employees weren't encountering. My husband had to leave and come and take because I was crying. I could, I'm a really tough woman. I'm just saying, Harm reduction is not working. If it worked, everyone wouldn't be on drugs. <laughs> Bringing truckloads of needles into our town every week and giving people a pass to take themselves straight to hell because they're gonna die, okay? They may not die of AIDS, but they're gonna die from shooting up. And that's what's going on right now. These people are dying. And if you're telling me I don't know what I'm talking about, I used to be homeless and I was on drugs 15 years ago. And you wanna know what helped me stop? Stopping, stopping. Not getting a free place to live and shoot up. Not having people tell me, oh honey, it's gonna be okay. Here's a crack pipe. It's free because we care about you. That's not what I needed. I needed help. So I got help and I got off drugs. What is the answer for us? We, do, do you guys want a, a van full of needles coming to our town every month? I don't, but why is it coming here? Do we need another trap house? No. Because that's what the William Wood House is. It's embarrassing, you guys. It doesn't work. I'm really good friends with the person who had that place built. He's a good friend of mine. And you know what? He doesn't work for multi-service center anymore. Okay? Because he's so discouraged. I know so many people that I work directly with at multi-service center. And they cr I was holding one of the directors in my arms because she said, I don't know why we're doing this. It's not helping. They need treatment. They need mental health counseling. That's what I needed. I needed to get off drugs. So I'm saying... How are we supposed to, because this is Seattle, I moved to Federal Way because I don't want to live in Seattle, okay? Yeah, I, Erica, I, we, And I know I'm taking a long time, but you right. guys don't listen to us. I'm asking, will you please listen? Please listen to these people. That's why we're here. Please. We're here. Thank you, Erica. So I echo what she says, but it sounds like you're sending it here whether we like it or not. 
So um, please listen to us. We don't want that. We don't want what they're doing in Seattle. Okay? So because you're, you're forcing this on us, you need to look out for the people next door. They need to be a priority. I hear there's no security. There's no security at this facility. And, you know, we know the stats. I looked at that study that you cited. It, there's, there's a, a, I think it was like 170 calls in four months to Renton. And so we know what we're looking at here. So um, nobody even knows this is coming. We've got people at Uptown Square that don't even speak English. How are they going to fend for themselves when they have this stuff going on next door? What? Are you going to talk to them about it? No, because they're Sir, one at a time. Sir, calm down. We need to look out for the vulnerable people in our community. And that means the people that live here that aren't breaking the law, that aren't doing drugs, the people that are paying the taxes. Come on. Listen to us. We're paying the bills. Thank you. All right. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, city council members, city staff, my neighbors, and the representatives, uh, Taylor and Johnson, and other elected officials and appointed officials. I am Janice Clark, a citizen. Mr. Mayor, I rise in support of public safety. As you well know that public safety should be the number one priority for any municipality, police and fire. Mr. Mayor, it is my hope that you will negotiate an interlocking agreement or interagency agreement with King County to ensure that there is a bulletproof safety plan for the neighbors and those inhabitants that will eventually be housed in those two locations that's up for question. And finally, Mr. Mayor, I urge you to do that which is necessary legal and right to be very vigilant about reducing crime here in federal way. It is not all on you, Mr. Mayor, so I stand shovel ready with my heart, my hand, my heads, and my health to be a change agent for the betterment of our communities and for the better like quality of life for all the citizens and residents in federal way. I'm Janice Clark and I thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the time. Thank you. Hello. Um, I just started a group uh, this year because I've been dealing with um, trying to get a hold of what's going on in our woods out here in our city with the uh, people coming daily, um, homeless, drug addicts. Let's just say it. They're drug addicts and it's nothing, I'm not saying this in a way that I dislike drug addicts. I love them. They're people, they're human, but we are not a humane society to be able to allow these people to do what they're doing right now. And I'm embarrassed to tell you the truth, what this state is not doing. There's no leadership from the governor, from uh, King County, or from this city to do something about it. What I do see is someone trying to look good and clean things up when people are looking and getting a picture. But I've been out there, I've gone and talked to them, and I thank you very much for your service to our country, sir. But I've walked out there and I've talked to these people. They'll all tell you they're not doing drugs. You st sit there and talk to them like people for about five minutes and they're gonna tell you what kinds of drugs they're on, who's in their little community, who's good, who's bad, and who is actually um, you know, really bad, okay? I've seen women that are, have black eyes. I've seen women that are disheveled. I've seen them on, uh, on um, uh, mattresses in the middle of the woods. And we have a drug problem here. We have people dying out there. And we have to do something about it. And um, like, uh, like um, our city council member, Co Coach Mar said, we do need to stand up and do something about it. This is our city. They need to talk to us and tell us what's going on. You need to come to us and ask us what we think, what we found out out there. I didn't have the mayor ask me what I saw out there. I didn't have anybody go out there and say, hey, what did you guys see out there? What, did you, what, do you, what should we do? Um, what, are you, what are your opinions, okay? You just go and do stuff that we, don't, we aren't about. I want our city council to get together and, um, and ban these two hotels from coming in. It's not a done deal. They can buy those hotels. We can do better things with those hotels if you guys will let us do it. 
Um, if you want to put a facility in there where you require them to actually get help, I want all these people to get help. I want the ch police chief to tell his people to go out there, and when you're doing something against the law, I want you to go there, and I want you to arrest them, okay? I want you to go into drug court in our own city um, for a misdemeanor or whatever it is, and leverage them getting help. Do something. Be proactive. Don't say you can't do anything. So please, don't say, oh, we can't do it. These, we have, our hands are tied, all those things. That's not true. We can go pick at that place. I can put a fence around it, um, and then the, you can actually use it. I won't do that because it's probably against the law. But I know that we could do it legally in some way. We can actually do something as a community and help people instead of being political and so on. It's not a political thing. We could be Republican and Democrat and still um, care for people. But that's number one thing. But caring for people might not be to go give them what they want. I mean, we have people in our community going out there. We've found 10,000 needles in these uh, in the hylobos, in the woods. Our kids are supposed to be able to go play in this stuff. There's um, private property out there that you allow these people to steal a Target cart. And guess what? There's no address on it. It's Target. <laughs> There's only one Target here. We know where it's supposed to go. Tell them, we got to take this stuff from you, bring it back. So I'm sorry about uh, taking so much time. Um, I'm very excited about this and kind of, you know, whatever. But thank you very much for everybody listening. And thank you for, um, Police Chief, for doing everything that you can. I hope you can do more for us. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'm Jack Walsh. I've lived here in Federal Way for 36 years now, had a business here for 10 years. And there's a lot more people back there than what there are here, so I'm going to turn this around. So, all right. I don't mean to turn my back on you, man. No, actually, let's do that. Actually, pull that closer. Uh, pull that further up here. That's a really good idea, Jack. Let's do all that. All right. Hey, yeah, let's do so, that. From now on, you guys. Right. That way you can be looking at the camera and, and everybody else. Go ahead. All right. All right. First off, I want to thank Chief Wong for his uh, addressing the things he said today. The police have a challenging job right now, and I am very disappointed that our 30th district legislators from right here made his and the police department's job much, much, much harder. The legislature needs to be supporting law enforcement rather than, no pun intended, handcuffing law enforcement. <laughs> There's so many issues going on right now. Uh, one thing that I, I strongly believe is that this is not a homeless crisis. It is an addiction and mental health crisis. We, that's what needs to be addressed. And the idea of, of, uh, of, what's their term, housing through harm reduction, I mean, hey, there might be a little bit of merit to that, but it first needs to be help with recovery, and it needs to be care in the stick. The law enforcement needs to make it uncomfortable for people to maintain that lifestyle. The county providing needles to support a habit, is that compassion? No. That is absolutely not compassion, and that needs to be addressed. We need to be doing things compassionate, helping them rather than enabling them. I have a business just about 100 yards from where the extended stay is. And I agree with Erica Norton that basically that would become a drug house if it were there. Right in our downtown, we do not need to have a facility that facilitates the use of drugs. That is not what we need here. We need to send a strong message to the mayor, to the city council, and to King County that we do not want it there, and it should not be there. There's a lot more to say. I think my time is up, but thank you. I want to especially thank Council Member Coach Marr and Honda for instigating this meeting. Okay, I, um, what I'm going to start doing is actually, uh, we're going to start actually using the timer. Come on up. Um, I'm going to start using the timer because we want to make sure we get to everybody and uh, we want to hear uh, as much uh, from as many people as possible. So I'll, I'll let you know when the three minutes. Go ahead. I just want to thank, I want to thank the law enforcement of the whole entire United States of America. I would not want your job. Nobody wants it, but thank you for doing it. 
You do the hard part. And there's so many people praying for you. For those who believe in prayer, let them be encouraged by that. For those that don't, they get it for free. I think it would be great if politicians and people in office would separate the phrase homeless and drug addiction. Because people will hear help families that need help. We would jump at the chance because for whatever reason, they're homeless and they need help. But to put people like, uh, I had a neighbor that got picked up and went to the Washington State Hospital, whatever that's called, it's coma, for 18 months. Then when he came home, he was home two weeks before he started using again. He doesn't have mental issues. He's a drug addict and he needs to be called what he's called. And I just would hope someday that this, when you see someone on the street and they're homeless due to drug addiction, I think that's so disrespectful to families who are out there by no means of their own. That's all I have to say. Okay, so the only reason I'm here today is for my children. Sorry, I know I'm short. Um, the only reason I'm here, I'd much rather be at home with my kids, is because I'm worried about my kids in the city that they're going to be growing up in and they're going to be living in. And they have been seeing things that they're becoming normalized to that they shouldn't be. So last night, I ended up watching a, media, a meeting from April 25th, 2019. I don't know if you know which one I'm talking about, but where you and your wife looked at each other because you'd seen a frontline documentary of a woman who was dying at, from drugs and from um, pneumonia, and you said, that that's unacceptable. That's not compassionate. Those were your exact words. Yeah, that are. is not compassionate to let people lay in the streets like that. I don't know how many pictures I've seen of people lying in the streets like that in federal way. I don't know how many times, I can't even tell you. And so then you also went on to say, you said that King County had a failure of leadership. Those were your exact words. I edited that video. I'm the one that circulated that video last night. That's what I was doing. My 13 year old was teaching me how to do that. Seeing her mayor, <laughs> seeing her mayor doing that. Right. And saying that, okay, I'm, I'm almost done. So, um, and you said that was a failure in leadership and that that would not be coming here. That, those were your words. That would not happen in federal way. You said it two or three times. So the other thing is, I want to know, where is your compassion for the families that are living here? I was in Uptown the other day. I wanted to go see where the extended stay was, who was going to be affected, and I walked through Uptown. I went to the bus stop. Because it's a mile away or less to, from an elementary school, those kids have to walk. They don't get to get bused. So they're going to be walking. I put a videotape. I walked the walk that they would be going. It's over the fence of where the extended stay is. So then I'm videotaping, and I'm explaining this, and I had people coming out. What are you doing? Why are you on my property? Why are you taking videos? I started to, at first I was like, oh, they're going to be upset with me. They weren't. They said, let me tell you my story. The woman who lives right across on the other side, six feet, has had people passed out on her stairways, using drugs on her stairways. She had to clean them up because her six children has to walk over the needles to get to her front door. Okay? Then her neighbor comes out and is like, I want to talk too. She tells me her story. Then another lady. I have people reaching out to me on Facebook telling me this. And guess what all of them have in common? None of them knew the extended stay was going to be turned into this. Where, what, at what point, I mean, maybe you don't legally have to notify them that their children are going to be over the side of a gate from this happening, but this is already, they're already experiencing needles, drugs, all this. You have an ethical responsibility to let all those mothers know. That's all I have to say. All right. Yeah, what, what she was referring to was the frontline program, which I would encourage you all to watch, which talked about the lead program in King County, of which I was a, I was a King County prosecutor for 16 years. And after I left, they started the lead program, which in my opinion is a failed program. I do not support it. We, and I, we have never allowed lead to come here. So what I said is exactly true, is that we have not brought that program here because I don't believe it. But then, obviously, we've had the change in law in regard to any prosecution of drug crimes. So you heard the chief just say, it doesn't matter if someone's shooting up in front of us, they get a warning, they get a second warning, and then they get, on the third, they get a simple misdemeanor. That is the status of the law. Why are you inviting it here? I'm not inviting anything. This is not a, say, excuse me, please don't, please. I'm telling you that what I said then is exactly how I feel now. We have never allowed the LEAD program here, but the LEAD program now is irrelevant because of the new state law. Yeah. It's irrelevant. Why? Well, Does he stand up and demand No, no, 
No, that's not what this is. Let's go. Come on. No. Hey, hey, hey. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, I want to say something. If you, if you want. I want to say something. We are going to conduct, everybody, everybody, just take a breath. We are all neighbors. I, Jamila, let's, we're all neighbors. And everybody's, everybody is working for the betterment of the community. And we have different ways of going about She is, she's trying to. But what I'm trying to do is make sure that we don't let this degenerate. Representative Jamita Taylor. Yeah. All right, so just so you understand, the Blake decision came at a point in the legislature when we had closed policy and we had nearly locked our budget. And we had to respond and ensure that we had uh, uh, um, criminal sanctions that were responsive to what the community needs are. And we also know that across the state, there are different needs for different communities. Seattle had So we also know that there needed to be more community engagement. So what we did was build the beginning of the system to build it in the way communities want to respond. So wait, excuse me. So the, what I'm trying to say is that what we introduced as legislation is a three-part process. The legislator, legislature had to address the illegal harms that were committed upon our citizens. So the, the part of the problem was that we have to address the past harms, the legal financial obligations, the resentencings, and then we also had to address what would happen if someone came into contact with law enforcement? And so we couldn't have piecemeal legislation, ordinances. You could have someone who could be in, um, at risk of a gross misdemeanor and a misdemeanor and a felony in one jurisdiction. We just couldn't have that. So we had to have us respond on a state level. We also made a down payment investment on treatment services Reentry services, and the expectation is that communities will build collaboratives to ensure that there's a holistic response. Because it can't just be about clearing out encampments and then clearing them out and clearing them out. We cannot arrest our way out of this problem. Our, we cannot arrest our way out of this problem. Because our city budget here is already at 52, 54% law enforcement and court services. We can't keep going in that direction. So we have to do something else. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the harm reduction is the only answer. It is not the only answer. But what I'm saying is that we are beginning the community response on it. I am working, Jesse is working, Claire is working right now. And we're asking you to come speak to us in, in forums that are a little bit more intimate so we can get more in depth around what you are experiencing, how you want to participate in the solutions that the community needs. This is a shared responsibility between state, local, and our federal government. And so it requires us to continue the conversation and take action. It's not just our community that's going through this. Grays Harbors County, for example, very conservative town, very conservative community, is asking for solutions that are beyond just arrest and release. Okay. Arrest and release does not work. So what I'm saying is please schedule appointments with us. Please keep your appointments because there are a lot of folks who have scheduled appointments with me and don't show up. So how do I get your feedback if you don't show up to the meeting? We're going to have the, the uh, uh, Representative Johnson, then, uh, then the Senator, and then we've got to get back to public comment because we've got to... No, we're just... Yeah, I'm fine. We're good. Okay. We're good. Want to do that? Good. Okay. Good idea. Thank you. All right. Come on up. No, we did not have the whole legislative session. All right. All right. Thank you. I'm Jane Sidlow. I live in Federal Way. I moved here from Minnesota in 1995. And I've been happy here. I live in a nice little community at Heritage Court. And lately I've been thinking, do I have to move? Because things are getting really out of hand. And when I heard that we plan on 
taking extended stay and putting drug addicts in there with no, my understanding is no treatment plan or no, no accountability is my understanding. We don't need a crystal ball to figure out how this is gonna go. We already know, we have plenty of examples all over this state. I worked in Seattle for a couple years. It's a mess up there. Nobody wants to go up there anymore. The policies have failed. They're, they're, it's insanity. And now the, the law enforcement has their hands tied. What, what do we even need police for if they can't arrest people? And then we want to invite more drug addicts into our community because the word gets spread out. You can have the needles. There's no accountability. You can do the drugs. You're not going to get arrested. You can rob and you can go in a store and you can take what you want and the police can't do anything. <laughs> Who wants to stay here? I want to thank every one of you for being here tonight. Yes. Because we need involvement. How did we even get to this place? It's because we were silent. Yes. Years and years of silence. And now we've got this mess. And we don't have the answers. There are answers. If you're a criminal, you need to go to jail. Yes. But we don't want the real answers. We don't want accountability. People don't want accountability. They, they don't want to take responsibility. They want a pat on the back. Oh, you poor little thing. Let's put you in a motel and pay for it. <laughs> Anyways, I didn't have this all written out. This is just coming from passion, from what I have been feeling. And I think we're all feeling this way. We, all, we might not have the same point of view or same politics, but I think we, none of us hate the homeless people. We want the best for them, but I have a nephew that's homeless and on drugs. My brother put him in a, in a nice apartment in Tacoma, but that did not work. He was an artist. He bought him all the supplies. He tried to get him into treatment. He didn't want any of it. He's, he's tra he goes throughout the country. He goes to Florida, to Minnesota. He comes up here and he's just, he doesn't want that. And I'm done. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Daniel Miller. And like the previous people said, I am concerned about the uh, potential purchase of the extended stay in the Red Lion because I guess I look at it also from a business standpoint. Um, what's going to happen to the tax revenue that normally would come from people that stay at, customers that stay at those hotels or motels, that's lost, lost tax revenue. I'm assuming that um, the, if the homeless people are put in these motels or hotels, that um, that's going to be funded by tax money either at the county and or the state level. So that's lost revenue, more taxes put on us. Uh, for those of us who own property, that's probably going to mean higher property taxes. Also, there's, I believe there's the unintended consequences like some, so many people eloquently pointed out earlier. Uh, public safety risk, whether it's needles. And then also, I just wanted to touch on the accountability. How do we know that that's going to work? How do we transition those people out of those hotels into sufficient housing on their own, where, they're, where they become uh, productive members of society? Are we just going to um, continue to exacerbate their problem by housing them in these hotels, whether it's Red Lion or Extended Stay? So th those are my issues. And then, and then lastly, maybe, is, was it Leo, is that your name? Who has the ultimate jurisdiction over a policy like this? Is it the county level or the city level? Because you mentioned that Dow Constantine being King County Executive, 
uh, whether it's in Redmond or Renton or Seattle or now in Federal Way, who has the final say on whether or not a policy of purchasing hotels to house the homeless is actually going to take place? And and that's that's kind of my one of my concerns too. Is you know maybe that's more of a legal issue. Is ultimately who ha who can make that determination? I mean, county or the city? And the, those are pretty much my comments. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, uh, Mr. Miller, I, I would note that the property is currently zoned for that. This is, let, let's just talk, talk about general. The property is currently zoned for it. Uh, that we're, we'll review it, though, with Brian Davis and the Community Development Department. When we get an application, we'll review our zoning and we'll review it. Um, it is a county program; it's not a city program. But uh, good questions, and we'll make sure that uh, we'll make sure as we go through this uh, that we get that. And then um, and when we get done with the comments, uh, I'll, I'll uh, ask Leo if he's got any further comment. All right, let's. All right. Thanks, Ken. My name is Marites Rosales. I live four houses away from Extended Stay. I raised my children here in Federal Way, five of them. Before these things happen, I can walk from my house all the way to my, where I work safely. I don't think about any danger that will happen to me. But since this homeless thing happened, that all the homeless people coming in to Federal Way, my kids calls me all the time, mom, do not walk. It's very dangerous. It's Federal Way. My kids grow up here. I live five houses, four houses away from extended stay. It hurts me so much when we learned that you are buying extended stay. I raised my children here. I have eight grandchildren always in my house. We were burglarized twice already since this thing happened. Nothing happened. We just beg, we are begging for you not to take those drug addicts in our neighborhood. This is our city. This is our city. I live and work here. And I agree with all the people here that those people need treatment. We don't need to feed, you know. We are feeding them what, what they want. Mental health treatment, that's all they needed. You don't house those people and they will trust. I'm four houses away from that, from that hotel. Don't buy that. There's so many people down there, small kids, high school kids. They see that every day. If you put those people, those drug addicts there, they can see that. That's not a good example. It's not a good example for our young people, young children to see it. That's all I can say. Hi, um, everybody here, Mayor Farrell, the council, um, people of Federal Way. My name is Lana Bostic, and I've lived in Federal Way for over 40 years. And I'm on the Senior Advisory Commission. I ha am the APCO with the 30th LD. Been pretty proud to live in Federal Way, actually, for a long time. So, surprise, I'm going to have another take on this whole thing. Um, First of all, I want to thank um, Representative Johnson and Representative Taylor and Senator Wilson for doing an extraordinary job in the legislature this year. Um, I want to thank Jesse for seeing the future with uh, policing and doing some things that really need to be done. And so thank you for, for them. I also want to say that I think everybody I've also been a nurse for over 42 years. I worked in hospice and a lot of different things. I also want to say that anybody here could be one health crisis away from being homeless. Not just um, immediately, but if you are in a health crisis and you don't have insurance and you lose your job, and it, it's true. It, 
And um, I know there's a lot of drugs going on, but I don't think that's the main thing about homelessness. I think that there's families that are homeless. Please, and, please be respectful. Yeah, please. I, I'm not going to interrupt you. Um, I think that's a problem, and I think we need to solve it. And the thing is, somebody said, um, homeless people need homes. Um, if you are trying to be in treatment, and the thing that you're most concerned about, I think, is if what you have in your grocery cart is not going to get stolen, and you're going to be able to find a meal, the next meal, then you're not going to have any way to figure out how to get into treatment and how to get rid of your addiction. Um, so the main thing that people need is safe homes, and I'm totally in support of the hotels, and I want to thank Leo for coming here and explaining that. Um, I, just, I just feel like that for some reason we can be the reason that somebody believes in the good of people, and that we can, I want to thank you for talking about people, homeless people, like they really are people, and not just labeling them drug addicts or losers or anything like that. It's just saying that these are people that have been on hard times and that truly need help. And we may not be able to help all of them, but I think giving them a home and giving them some safety and hoping that you by the grace of God, never end up in their situation, and having some compassion for other people um, is what we really need at this time. The pandemic has been super hard on everybody, and I am just, I support this, this housing, and he's given me the get off the gong show. So thank you for your time. Okay, thanks. Hello, my name is Kerry Carlson. I live pretty close to the uh, middle school, uh, the Mirror Lake School. Really, really a nice school. It's really nice, and we got lights on the road now and everything like that. Oh, and by the way, we had a representative um, in Celebration Park to kind of get us in the mood. He was sitting there shooting up as we drove by. So that's one nice. ticket, one tiki for him, if you want. <laughs> yeah. I'll be real short. Uh, just got a couple of questions, uh, and we'll make it this very simple. Who, and I'll raise the hands, and I want you to turn around and look at these people. Who has had theft or packages stolen or been a victim of a crime? Raise your hand. You see all that? I do. Now we double do. that by three when they come in, because they are going to bring in more homeless and to the extent of state, yay, isn't that nice? The, you know, I grew up in the, in the 60s. We had Woodstock, and we had a drug problem, but, you know, we weren't stealing things. We were trying to chase orange <laughs> dragons, you know? And it was a lot, you know, so there wasn't too much going on. But you've got to realize, these are really, really hard drugs. You can't get off of them. And you either, you know... You don't get off them or you die. Yeah. And it's really, really going to be hard to get these people help. What we had in the 60s was called, and I want you to know this word, rock bottom. Yeah. You got to get the rock bottom. If you don't, you got a place to stay, you got your drugs, you got your free needles. Hell, you got everything. You're nocturnal. You go out and you steal at night. You got more money. You do the same thing over and over and over again, you know. So the next question I want to give everybody by a raise of hands who wants to buy the hotel? Okay, so now this is what I want to say. Yeah, you have your answer. The people have spoken. You work for us. We have spoken. And if you buy it, there's hell to pay. Now, the other thing that I, that's new to Federal Way, and I want to address the police for this, that they have a new saying. Can't touch me, can't touch me, can't touch me. You know, they go out. I don't even know how Safeway stays in business anymore. They walk right out. And so I, I was a little worried that maybe if I went and stole something, but after reading your article that you put in Facebook today, 
All I have to do is run. And ain't nothing you can do about it. So we have no accountability. So we need accountability, people. So, you know, there used to be law and order. That worked pretty good. Yeah. Let's keep it going. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Darren Mandeville. I'm a, bus a small business owner and um, a homeowner in Federway. I'm super nervous. I have a big mouth. My best friend will contest to that, but I don't ever put it out there because I'm a business owner and I work with vulnerable adults and I work with people with Alzheimer's and dementia and I own a business. And so you're always afraid of being targeted if, depending on the letter you have behind your name. I don't think anybody in this room has a problem helping a homeless person. I think a lot of people in this room have a problem helping a drug addict who happens to be a homeless person also. So my first question, now just, just a little backstory. I was born and raised in South Miami. Like I'm, I was the minority growing up. So I'm no stranger to the problems that we have here. I've lived in Washington State for 20 years. 19 of them have been in federal way. I moved here to work for the University of Washington. Um, my question, um, Chief Huang, who, how many officers do we have adequate policing in federal way? Let's use your time. You've got about a minute and a half, and I'll, have, I'll, I'll give him the microphone okay. as soon as you I'm get a, done. I'm going to assume the answer is no. We probably don't have enough officers than for the amount of people that we have. Well, so let me, let me stop this for a second. Let me pause. Um, there are 137 uh, budgeted officers, and there are, as of today, the information I got from the chief, there are nine vacancies. We're working hard to fill those. 137 is the highest number that we've ever had for budgeted officers in the history of the city, and it's and it's about trying to fill up those vacancies. So let me hit, let me hit resume. Okay. So my main question is to the, our legislators who, P.S. work for us. Um, I want to know, as a business owner and a taxpayer, twice because I own a business and a home. Um, whose idea were these new bills? I, I own an adult family home, so I'll probably lose business for even putting this out there, but at this point, I don't care. I, three of the top referral agencies for my industry, the most vulnerable of our citizens, people who built Federal Way, um, they don't send them to Federal Way anymore. I've always had a waiting list for my adult family home, always, since I opened 12 years ago, Somebody that just spoke a few minutes ago can contest to that. Uh, referral agencies don't send people to federal way anymore because of what they're hearing from people. The crime, it, it's ridiculous. Who, who thought that this was a good idea? Did you talk to your constituents? Because I don't remember getting any surveys, phone calls, anything about these, these new bills, the 1054 and the 1310. How are our police supposed to protect us and the safety? This is really, and then you add in the homeless encampments and this hotel, which, oh my God, and taking away more of what our officers are able to do for us. So I, I just, I, I'm super confused and I'd like to know, like, how did we get here and what do we do to, to end it? So that's all. all right. Thank you. Hi. I am well known by many people in this room for a lot of reasons, liked or disliked. Uh, my name's Allison Fine. First, I just want to say, Chief Wang, I absolutely believe that being a police officer is a really tough job. I also think it's really hard to be a black person or a native person or a person of color in this world. So I think when we're comparing apples and oranges, we need to make sure that we're giving credit where credit is due. I also am not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I wonder how many people in this room have been homeless. Thank you, Erica. I, I was very aware of that. I wonder how many people in this room have been addicted to any kind of substance. I wonder how many people stopped the first time. Four, four people. About 12 people raise their hands, four people raise. Okay, so what I'm saying is that there's a lot of people in here that are talking about things that they've never experienced. I, this isn't a no, call no, no, and no. response. Let, let her talk, you guys. You guys this come isn't a call and response. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm, I, have to, I have to push pause. Let's, let's hear everybody out, okay? You can get in line, Jim, if you want to speak. So 
at this point, here's the thing, we are all one community. If you guys look at actual data, you will see that when people get locked up, they make it clean, probably not because they use a lot of drugs in jail, but even if they get clean in jail, they get out and they do it again, right? So permanently locking people up is not an actual solution. If you think your taxes are high now, if we're gonna permanently lock people up, it's very expensive to keep people locked up, number one. Number two, I have heard time and time again, I see, I see the homelessness in our community. I don't, I don't give money to homeless people. I may, I may buy food or I may do something tangible, but I don't give home money to that. Many of you know I have been deeply affected by drugs and alcohol. If we don't want people on our streets, then we don't want people in our encampments, and now we don't want them to be housed, where do we want them to be? We do not have treatment beds. No respect, no disrespect to the lovely lady that, that spoke before me. I work for the state. I work with people with disabilities. I, I have an adult that just got placed in an adult family home in Federal Way three months ago. So what she said is not 100% true. Maybe it wasn't her AFH, but they definitely still place people here. If you look at what our city looks like as compared to other cities that are our size, our demographics, we're just in line with growth. This is just what growth looks like, and I want a solution too. No, it really, <laughs> no, it actually does. Let her finish, you guys. Can I reclaim all that time? You got about 30 more seconds, go ahead. At the end of the day, we need to be a community. I know that you guys know who I am, and I know who you are, and this is a friendly Facebook community uh, reunion for some of you. But uh, at the point, the point that I'm, I'm frustrated with is that I don't hear any solutions. I just hear, we don't want them here. We don't want them on our streets. We don't want them on the median and Rite Aid. We don't want them in our woods. And we don't want them housed. But tr there's not enough treatment beds available. So I, I, ju I just hope that moving forward as a group, as a community, we can try and find more common ground because this, this is getting us nowhere. All right. It Thank really you. is. It's getting us nowhere. And, and I hope everyone can sit with that when they go home. Thanks, Allison. So before you get started, you guys, the beauty of our country, the absolute beauty of our country is that we have all these divergent viewpoints, but let's hear them out, okay? Even if you so strongly disagree with it, will you just, let, let's let people get through their time where they could say what they came to say, please. My name is Vivian Alexander. I've lived here in Federal Way for about four and a half years now. I'm, um, I was a chemical dependency counselor for 25 years. I do have a little problem with the harm reduction model. Um, I have to say, I'm in favor of having some housing. I'm in favor of maybe the purchase of a hotel. Um, I'm not so much in favor of the location here. I, I w and I didn't know that, that we had a choice, that if people were able, would have been able to get together, um, maybe, <laughs> There's so much passion here. So under the passion, I think there is um, people, there are people who want to create positive solutions. We come at it a little bit differently. Because um, I have to tell you, the, the amount of emotion in this room and, and sometimes the, the feeling that I'm feeling from it is hostility. And that's a little bit um, unnerving to me. So. Um, but I know that I know about passion, and I'm I'm so impressed and so thrilled to be part of this whole group and what everybody, all of us, want to accomplish. Um, I'm concerned about the location of that hotel if that's the one that's per purchased, and I have been since I found out about this. Having it right next door to Union Square with all of the children. I find it disturbing, and that's because I know the reality of the Econo Lodge because it was across the street from where I lived. 
Um, word gets out, uh, drugs are taking place here, or can be sold, can be uh, all of that, that whole scene. And um, so I'm concerned about the children that are there and the families that are there. There's only, I think somebody can tell me the answer to this, because you know, there's only like 80 uni units or so. There's not many units at that hotel. <clears throat> and the problem with that is we don't know if people will go to treatment. That's, kind of, I believe in the housing, that the need for housing first, but all these models don't fit together in my mind and in, in my reality. Um, and so that means if there's 80 apartments, 80 people who may or may not choose to, to go to treatment, if that's what they need, or mental health treatment, the people can live there for as long as they want to. The people do not have to leave. So I guess what I'm saying is, hopefully we can we really can find a solution, and it won't be that if we don't have this hotel, we get nothing. Because I think Federal Way needs, needs a hotel like this. All right, thank you, Vivian. <clears throat> Leo, how many units are there? Uh, I believe it's 101 units. 101 units, and I just want to reiterate, the city is not buying this, the county is buying this from a private property owner. All right, Catherine. Hi, my name's Catherine, and I've lived here 32 years. First, I don't know when you worked at WJW, the William J. Wood House on Pack Highway. I know somebody that works here currently and says it is absolutely not true that they're all drunk and they're all on drugs. So I don't know, maybe you knew different people than he knows, I don't know. Um, I've been kind of dismayed by the reaction here. I am not a Bible-thumping Christian kind of person, but it says in the Bible that you guys all know, I know you do, that whatever you do to the least of these, you do unto me. It says it. If you're hungry, we feed you. If you're thirsty, I give you drink. If, you, if you're home, let me finish. If you're homeless, we do something. If, you're, if you have compassion, where's the compassion? You know, I hear all these angry, angry people who I don't usually ever see at a city council meeting, by the way. And where's the compassion? Now, personally, I would like to see the hotel, the housing first thing, have a treatment component and say, you know, come here, be tra transitional, and, you know, stay here for a year or whatever it takes, and we'll move you on and bring somebody else in. I think that would be great. But let's have some compassion for these people. How are you going to get sober and off drugs if you're living under a tree? Good for you. Good for you. I got sober 40 years ago. Good for me. But they haven't. They haven't. They need help. Okay? All right. Thank you. Okay, this is the first time I've ever spoken in a meeting like this, so bear with me. My name is Jennifer Kaiser. I've lived in Federal Way for about 12 or 13 years. I live in a home that my stepfather's house built in the 50s. Uh, they live there. My house has been broken into twice. Um, one, one of the times, all my valuables were stolen, all my rings and everything that were given to me by my grandmother, my mom. I live right by Steel Lake Park to some of the entrances where you can walk in there. There are people walking down our street all the time. Um, it scares me. I've called the non-emergent number. I've had to call 911. I've got people that are sitting outside shooting up outside my house. Last night, I had to text my neighbor to say, hey, there's a sketchy guy out in the truck. Obviously, looked homeless. I don't know. I could be wrong. I don't support this hotel with this, just come here. Do whatever the hell you want, because you don't want. You can order needles and pipes and things to put around your arm. I don't even know what the hell they're called and you know swabs and everything just come join the party it's a party in federal way i'm glad that the police so also i just want to tell you one other incident um we had a car club come down our street 
illegal sirens, uh, just about 100 people pushed my elderly neighbor because we were wondering what the hell was going on. I had to run across the street. There was a guy in that group that brandished a pistol from his waistband and threatened me as my 21-year-old daughter was on the phone with 911 crying, saying my mom is probably about to be shot and killed. Do you know what the police had to do? They had to wait around the corner for backup. We need all those police. We do not need these people on drugs. This, I can't, I'm 53 years old. I'm seeing my kids losing friends. My daughter's lost several friends. She's 21 years old. This shouldn't be happening. This is crazy. I have thought my neighbors are thinking about moving. I'm thinking about moving. But if we can save our town, why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we band together? This, it's ridiculous. And how can we get that drug van to stop coming here with that stuff? How can we do that? I'm, I'm just asking, how can we do that? The King, thank you very much. Um, the King County drug van, there's state Supreme Court law on this that we actually went out, thank you very much. The state Supreme Court actually had a decision on this. We actually hired a separate lawyer to get a separate opinion because I talked to our legal counsel. He told us what the, what the Spokane decision that went all the way up to Supreme Court said. We do not have the legal authority to stop the van coming to, to Federal Way. We do not. And if we tried, we'd get sued and we'd lose. Did everybody hear that? I, I, we got to get we got to get with the other comments. But she makes up a really good point, and trust me, I, when I that came over the wires, I read it, gave it to legal counsel, and analyzed it. What was going on in California? What, what goes on in California is the the county that actually handles the needle van, actually in down in California, actually needs a permit. So it's something that actually has to be permitted on a on a regular basis. We don't have that here, and so Spokane has gone through this. We just. I'm sorry, what? Well, no, no, we, what I'm telling you is the, the highest, we all respect courts and the law, right? The highest court in the state of Washington, you guys, come on, well, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Oh, yes, we all do. And it's one of the great, we have the greatest country the world has ever seen. And one of the things that we, that is the hallmark of our republic is we respect courts. The state Supreme Court said that's the law and they can come into our community. And that's why we've been working with King County Public Health and trying to limit the number of needles they're giving, trying to limit the locations. That's why we went through this process. But you didn't come here to hear from me. Let, let's hear from Jim. Actually, you had a quick quick yeah, comment? Quick question. Yeah. Um, being the lawless can do lawless things. Stand up. Being the lawless can do lawless things. Um, what's to stop us to go to and find this homeless car, or I mean this uh, car right. with the needles, yeah. and just say you're not welcome here? If they try to get out, no, you get your car and get out of here. Well, this is actually, you guys, I, I want to I, I say something real quickly. I, I yeah, okay. The, the gentleman was referring to what's to stop individual citizens from essentially engaging with the King County Public Health van and essentially saying leave and not allowing them to, pre to prevent it. This is actually, we, we made a decision, I'm gonna to get to you, Jim, I promise. We made a decision as a community not to prosecute, not to fine, or not to do anything with the individuals, whoever they were, that dragged that stuff out of the, the, out of the encampment on 320th and 1st. Now we did that for a number of reasons. As a prosecutor for 19 years, in order to prove anybody committed a crime, you have to prove intent to commit that crime. I don't think the people that did that, I think the people that did that and the people that want to do it afterwards thought they were doing a great thing and doing the people a favor. Yeah. That's what I believe. But, you guys, and this is why this is important for us to talk as a community and to come together as a community. That doesn't make it legal. And that's why we went on a public, I'm gonna to get to the core, I'm kind of work, going the long way around the barn to get there. But the, the point of the matter is, we want, we like your passion, we love your passion. We know that it comes from a love of your community and a defense of your community, your family, your home, your future. I get it. That is what we do every day. But 
What we've got to be very careful of in this community is allowing that passion to spill over into self-help in which, you know, in, in, in regard to where someone's going to get hurt, someone's going to get in legal jeopardy. We do not want that. We cannot have that. So you guys may have read that article in the mirror. And when I read that article in the mirror, I winced. I thought, God, that just doesn't, you know, because we work for you. And then the whole, the whole tone of that was about prosecuting people who thought they did a good thing. We wanted to send a message and we want to make it really clear. We know you're passionate, but don't cross the line. Work with us, work within the confines of the law, community. You got it, every day, absolutely. And that's why we're here. All right, well, enough for, enough for me. But so, now, let's not do that. Let's not cross over. If you feel yourself getting that angry, the, the gentleman in the back of the room who got really upset at the beginning, Carol, I know, I know, I know you are. And that's because you've been victimized repeatedly and you see it with your business, Carolyn, I get it. You guys, I know, we drive around. And, and when Carolyn sent me an email yesterday about, about 320th to 99th, I drove out there and looked at it. You gotta work with us, communicate with us, communicate with your legislators. Jesse, Jamila, Claire, they care about this, they care about this community. Work with them, talk with them. Jim, thank you. My name is Jim Ross. I've lived in this community for 60 years. Grew up here, I went to school at Adelaide, went to school at Lakota, went to school at Federal Way. So I've seen this community for a long time. And the community is going the wrong way. Everybody in this room tonight here, I will say most, are here, Jim, because we're fed up, okay? We have asked and asked and asked again for help, and we're not getting it. And it has overflowed into anger now. And people are telling you, this huge crowd here is telling you, help us, okay? You need to go to Dow Constantine, Sir, you need to go to Godal Constantine, and you tell him, get that goddamn hotel out of our city. We do not want it here. Get it out, okay? Move on, put it somewhere else. I work across the street from where that hotel is. Every day, I watch drug addicts. I watch the homeless. I watch a gentleman who tried to kill a police officer in our state sit out there in a wheelchair and fall over. And it's not acceptable that we have these people in our community. And all of us are tired of it. And then to say that we're going to go get a hotel and put more of them here and let it be more, it's ridiculous. You as a city and as the mayor have asked King County to get rid of that bus stop that's right next to the Arco. And they haven't done it. Well, I guarantee to you there's 30 people that would come help me right now go tear that goddamn thing down and make it so that it's not the disaster and litter riddled drug infected spot that it is why don't we do these things why do we let king county demand and and say what we're going to do let's be our own city and take care of these things we need to people here are begging you to help us Okay, and we need your help. And, and we're here because we don't see it coming. And we need to stop Dow and whoever else is dictating. We need to go to PBR and get him to help and, and get people on our side. This started as a meeting where people asked two of our city council people to meet with us so that we could say in private what we wanted to do. Now today, it grew to where people are speaking up and they're speaking out and they're saying, we don't want this anymore, we don't want to live this way, we're not going to let our community go this way. Yeah, um, Mayor Farrell, you, uh, you said that uh, somebody's going to get hurt. Well, people are getting hurt. People are being accosted. People are having their homes broken into. Uh, they're the victims of theft and all sorts of what used to be crime. Uh, but it, apparently it is no longer. Um, so just, I didn't have any prepared comments, but just some observations from tonight. Um, this is what strikes me, is that policing has been abolished. And it's simply a backdoor. What we're hearing about these laws are backdoor methods for defunding the police. Criminal accountability is abolished. Uh, the criminal uh, element is more important, has more protection, illustrated by what you just said. Somebody's going to get hurt and ignoring the fact that people are already getting hurt. 
So we're, we have a, a top, a more, a higher priority for the ones who are committing crimes. <laughs> Health through housing is a rebranding of safe injection sites. That's, that's all it is. We denied those a long time ago. We said we don't want them. They rebranded it. Now it's housing first or health through housing. There, there'll be no accountability in those facilities. Illegal campers, I think I mentioned this, illegal, illegal campers are given a higher priority than people who work, who pay taxes, uh, and also face some daunting life challenges and, and take them on and um, do not turn to drugs and alcohol. They face those things down. Not as some people are stronger than others, but people do face challenges in life and they face them in different ways and they, they take control of those situations. So it is doable as we've seen testified by people who have been down that road and they got out of it. Um, so I just want to say that as a taxpayer, as a citizen, and I've overcome addiction myself, and I've um, been the victim of crime, I feel like I am a bottom feeder in this city, and that uh, the, the, the people that commit crimes are at the top of the food chain, and I'd like to see that reversed. Cynthia, before you get started, so we said we we're going to, hold on everybody, we said we we're going to end at 8.30, why don't we just do this, let's say that uh, I, we've only got a couple more speakers, let's go to the end of our speakers, and, um, and then after that, let's kind of see where we're at uh, after, after the speaker, so if anybody wants to get in, um, in line to speak, now would be the time, uh, because we're kind of looking, we're about 10 minutes past the time we're going to end, anyway, Cynthia, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Cynthia Ricks McElton. I've lived in Federal Way for several, several decades. I'm 53 years old, so when I say several, I mean several decades. I am one of your Human Services Commissioners. I work for Virginia Mason Franciscan Health out of St. Francis Hospital. I run a youth violence initiative program. I am active in the schools, making sure that we provide services for youth with special needs. I work in the zero, I volunteer and work in addressing zero youth detention policy and the disproportionate representation of students of color, of students with bilingual is, um, who are bilingual and disproportionate those who have disabilities in the juvenile justice system, those that are disproportionately low income and have experienced a lot of trauma. So why do I bring this up? I'm a data person. And I'm sorry, I'm being very calm here, but I have some health conditions and I'm trying to hold myself up. So that's why I'm holding onto my purse. So thank you for your patience. I'm a data person and here's where I know for a fact. Since COVID has hit nationwide, we've seen over a 60% increase in domestic violence. Since COVID, we have seen an 80% reduction in child care services across this country. Since COVID, we have seen 56% of our small businesses that employ 20 or less people go out of business and won't come back. This is nationwide. Extrapolate that to here. We're still collecting the data and the impact. What else do I know? I know for a fact when I go out there with my 13-year-old son that in Walmart and other places, we have families who are homeless who have been impacted by COVID and just before COVID hit that we knew about nationally, okay? Who are homeless, who have been trying to have their children in distance learning, who receive their diabetic medication, uh, the needles for their diabetic medication and other medication through the syringe exchange program. I have families who have experienced domestic violence and because they fear for being in the system and fear of catching COVID. They elect not to call the police and would rather live out on the street, hoping that when things open up, they can get assistance because it is difficult under COVID to provide those services. Now, remember I told you I was your human services commissioner. So it's my job to review, as along with many others, there's several of them here, to look at what programs come in for funding to provide a safety net in our community. Let me tell you what's happened. In the last four years, those of us who show up at King County 
have been pushing and moving for resources for human services to come here. And as a result of that, we've seen 152% increases in funding that have come from King County and the state here that wasn't coming before 2017. I want to thank our state legis reps. I want to state our representatives and all of those people out in the community who are concerned about what they see in the safety net for coming to the school board meetings and talking about how we need more assistance to assist those with McKinney-Vento, that come to the state legislator and say hospital systems like St. Francis need more assistance so that we can help those with mental health issues and substance abuse orders and be able to assist them. I want to thank those who are going out and voting for the King County um, BSK levy renewal that provides millions of dollars here in this community to provide a safety net to address those concerns that you just talked about. And, I, and lastly, I want to thank those people who have gone out into the community and said, you are experiencing homelessness. How can I help you? What can I do for you? By the way, if you've ever been to the hygiene center, we had three families who came in who said, someone stole my property. My birth certificate was in there, my Bible was in there, my Medicaid card was in there, and the only driver's license I have. So for those who want to go out and do what you think is cleaning up, just think about this. That is someone else's belongings. What you consider trash is some of them, it is their treasure. Right. Thank you, Cynthia. So okay. You guys, you guys, you guys, you guys, come on, come on. I'd first, I'd like, to, I'd first like to start with the, our mayor. We had signs up for free movies. There were no signs up about this meeting. Is that because you're afraid there'd be more of us here that want? I'd also, I'd also like to ask Jesse, Jesse to come up and speak to me personally because the last time I talked to him privately, he never got back to me. There was no response from our, our representative. And he, since he's been sitting here listening to us, he's been on his phone the whole time if you turned around and looked at him. So he's not listening to us. He didn't get back to me. He's not listening to us. I'd like to know if he knows how many pursuits, he's, he passed a law and signed it, how many pursuits that the, the, the police will not be able to make, how many pursuits ended up in, any, in the prevention of crime, and how many pursuits was somebody harmed that you passed that law for? Why did you pass that law? You've got two minutes left. We're, we're, okay. Yeah. Can you answer that? But we're not, we're not, gonna do we're that. not going to answer that we're, question. No, we're, you're, you're, so we, we'll do that in private when he doesn't answer the question. Maybe the chief could answer those questions for us. The laws that were written explain to us how they're going to prevent crime. And sir, if you want somebody to stand around, we don't have to do anything but put a barricade in front of it and they can do what they want. That is not illegal. So we can find, put you know, 20 of us in front of the, the, the drug, handing out needles, that will prevent that from coming into the city. So anytime, I'll give you my number. And if you think I'm not compassionate, my son was a drug addict. When he finally came up here from California, I didn't know where he was when I moved up here. The doctor I took him to said that he had a few months to live. We pulled him through and he's now a law-abiding citizen. But for almost 15 years, he lived on the streets. We put him in rehab many, many times. You want compassion? Give that hotel to the children who are now suffering homelessness, yes. to the domestic violence people who are now submitting WANIT. Do not put anyone in there that will not commit to treatment and getting off of drugs within one week. You can be off of drugs in one week and you can become a successful citizen, but do not put anybody in there that is on drugs. If they'll commit to being in there and they're not off of drugs in a week, get them out. Okay, we've got these two speakers left and then we're gonna be done. Hi there, everybody. Many of you know me, um, a lot of you know me. Took off my glasses so I won't see your um, reactions. My name is... Uh, <laughs> 
My name is Lou Jocelyn Lester. I've been living in the same house for 50 years here. And uh, thank you. Um, I raised all my children here, and many of you know them, and were their teachers and so forth. Um, what do I have to say? I'm a retired family nurse practitioner, so I took care of the heroin addicts. And my favorite one would come in and say, oh, ma'am, I've got to go out and dock. I've got to go out and give myself a hit so you can open up my abscesses. And I'd say, really? Ugh. Anyway, I finally got him clean. And he said, if I die before that, I'm going to leave you my farm. And I said, what kind of farm? And he says, my pot farm. And I said, don't leave me your farm. <laughs> so <laughs> seriously, um, I really want to commend everybody for being here. Um, I was on the first, um, oh, one of the first committees here, first planning committee. Um, and so I, I was very involved in the city. and. Been a little ill for the last few years, so I haven't done that. But my, I got robbed in my house at gunpoint, and my, my children and I held hostage. Um, I ended up having our next door neighbors walked out of their house, and we had druggies and you name it there for three years before we finally got rid of them. And that's when somebody else bought the house and shooed them out. Police came out a thousand times with guns and everything because we always had something going on. So I understand the problems and I commend you all for being here again and for going through the treatments and being supportive of the people that are here. Um, what else did I want to say? I, my kids turned out okay, um, even though they used to sit on the roof and watch people go by. Went to, um, <laughs> went to Twin Lakes, um, Lakota, Decatur. Uh, my oldest one kind of fooled around for a while, and she's finally going to be 50 in November, getting her doctorate in education. I thought, okay, fine. That's Melissa, if any of you know her. Um, my second one, my son, uh, was the one that used to sit on the roofs. And he became a physician, and he's um, the co-director of the, the Family Medicine Residency Program at Oregon Health Sciences. So he's a teacher also. My youngest one was somebody's teacher's pet, at least I think so. Um, and she became a teacher. She has two teaching degrees, and she was the director of English at Georgetown University. Anyway, right now they all do their part in the community and have belonged on committees, and they would love this uh, because it shows all of our involvement, all of our caring, and we know it's not the best place in the world, but for us, it's home. And, you know, I, I mean, I've seen you all, and I have the passion that's in this room. I thank you for letting us have this meeting, and I encourage you to do your volunteer work. I mean, I did it, and it was the most uh, satisfying thing I've ever done. We started at the clinic the, uh, here for people that were indigent. Anyway, I want to thank you all, and I, I just really go for it. Let's just continue to be together. Yeah. Okay. Hello, my name is Grace, and I'm a resident here for 19 years. Um, and we know from Ken and from David that go into the encampments that most of the people don't live here. Closer. Most of the people don't live here. So the people that are ravaging our city and keeping it under siege are from out of town, or they're not even from Washington State. So, and I don't know why people from public health come here and they make believe they don't realize that they don't have knowledge of what's going on in these places. Like on PAC, that's where we have a big concentration of our crime. And what's there? It's the drug motels where they get vouchers from King County to go there and stay there. And then May 5th, I'm driving up PAC Highway and across from one of the drug motels, I see police activity. I go home later and find out it was the homicide of a woman, of a woman there. And was that even on the news? How many people heard about that or know about that? And so I want to know with what you've heard today, does it make a difference? And is there something we can do to keep this, these motels from being turned over into whatever you want to call them, shelters or housing? Is there something we can do? Is there anything that we can say that will keep you from doing that in our community? So I would like a response to that. Like, Grace, you've got a minute and a half. Can we do anything to not have this come here? Uh, Grace, the, 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 period, the, the period, maybe you could talk with him after um, the- If uh, you want to respond now during my time, you could do that. 
Grace, that's not what we're, this is for public comment. You've got, you've got a minute left. We don't want it here, and I want to know what we can do to keep it from coming here. Because what's the point of all of us talking? Was it just so that it can be said that we were heard, and then it doesn't make a difference that we all came here today? I mean, what's the point of being here if we can't affect a change by our presence? That's all I have to say. All right, thank you. So I think um, to the individual that just spoke's point, this is about um, making sure that your government officials hear about what, what concerns you. Uh, I think when we talk about homelessness and uh, the many issues that we have, it's important that every part of the government hears this. So if you have complaints to the county, reach out to your King County Council member. If you have complaints to the city, reach out to your city council members or your mayor. If you have complaints about the legislature, reach out to me. And I think the, the gentle lady spoke. Um, I try to answer every official email. We get thousands of emails a day. I sat in a coffee Please. shop with you a year ago, pre previous to COVID, and you never got back to me. I walked into a meeting like this. You never walked up to me and asked and said, I'm sorry, I couldn't get a response. You, I walked up to you. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, and I remember that conversation. Well, well, yeah, I remember that conversation, too. Oh, you set up. And you stood me up on both accounts. I took time out of my work day. I sat on my school bus at 1 o'clock both those days because you rescheduled. I, I went through it with your wife or whoever's running your, your deal. My oh, wife's not running. <laughs> well, I, I thought you had the last day. I'm sorry. Okay. I took time out of my work day, and I sat there on my school bus at 1 o'clock both those days, and I waited for your phone call. And you didn't even have the courtesy to apologize to me after the first time you stood me up. So finally, I quit emailing you because I realized that I cannot count on my representative. So, I'll be brief. There's, during session, there's a lot that goes on, right? And so, I want to answer the questions about um, the police bill. So, when we talk about police reform, we had a year-long legislative process. We had law enforcement involved, we had community involved, we had uh, advocates and um, other members of the community, and we came up with policy that is gonna make our community safer. You may not agree with that. I would like to finish, thank you. I would say too, to our police department's uh, credit, the police department, a lot of the stuff that we're doing in the, in the bills has already been done. Federal Way has already eliminated chokeholds, already eliminated neck restraints. We're expanding this statewide. The Fraternal Order Police, the largest police union, endorsed both of our bills for a reason. Because they see the need for a paradigm shift. They see the need for de-escalation, for less lethal enforcement of the law. If someone's committing a crime, criminal trespassing, if they're uh, public disturbance, that is a crime that police can and should respond to. So uh, I appreciated the, the chief's uh, presentation, but with all due respect, if there's a crime being committed, police have a legal obligation to respond, and that is not changing. What is changing is that when they do respond to that crime, they should de-escalate the situation first when available or appropriate. And if they cannot, then force is then able, able to be used. So I just wanted to clarify that because it's important that not, we cannot let infactual things just go running around and expect it to be true because it's not true. But there's multiple chiefs have gone together and decided that those words that you put in there actually put, tied their hands. So you need to do something and go explain yeah. to And we have that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. Thank you. Yes. Right. I agree with that. And there will be further clarification. There's also, again, there's also over 50 chiefs across our state that believe we're headed in the right direction as it relates to these bills. And so I think it's important, again, we had a legislative process where people had the opportunity to testify. I received over 1,200 emails saying that we needed these bills in our state. You know how many I received?
that said we did not need these bills, less than 50. That is, that is. So I think it's important if you want to reach out to me, reach out to my legislative email and we can continue to discuss this. But I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. All right. Well, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming. I think that the most important thing we did tonight was hear you. And I were really very, very important. I'd like to thank everybody for your public comments. I'd like to thank uh, the directors who, uh, who participated. I'd like to thank the staff that actually helped us. Let's give them a big round of applause and our volunteers who helped as well. This is an ongoing conversation. We work for you and thank you very much for coming tonight.